Hello there. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Atlantic Council. My name is Geisha Gonzalez, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Eurasia Center. It is my absolute pleasure to be welcoming Mr. Hikmet Hayyev, who is the Foreign Policy Advisor to the President of Azerbaijan, for a discussion on the country's foreign policy initiatives, its plans for the Caucasus region, and as well as its Western strategic partners. Uh, for those of you that are following the live stream, please be sure to use hashtag AC Eurasia. And for those of you in the audience as well, many familiar, friendly faces here. Um, before I cede the floor to Ambassador Dick Morningstar, who is the chairman of the Global Energy Center here at the Council and a board director, it is my pleasure to welcome Mr. George Kent, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for European and Eurasian Affairs, for some welcome remarks. George. Thank you very much. And oops. first of all, I'd like to add my uh, greetings and, and welcome to Hikmat. Uh, we'll see him over at the State Department later this afternoon. It's an afternoon full of uh, visitors and friends from the South Caucasus. We have our uh, strategic partnership uh, commission with the Georgians this afternoon, so I'll be leaving a little bit early from here, and I apologize for that. Uh, but I'm very pleased to uh, uh, introduce and, and uh, start the conversation. Uh, not only with Hikmat, but uh, with Dick Morningstar, who has worn many hats and is a friend, I'm sure, to everyone in the room. Uh, when we talk about the South Caucasus, since we've got both uh, Azerbaijani and Georgian friends uh, in town today, uh, it reminds me that when I go to the region, and I was there last month, that the leaders of all three countries of the South Caucasus often refer to the three former empires that have formed a triangle, Russian, Persian, and Ottoman Turk, that have shaped their countries in the region. Uh, and I think that's a historic context that is very deep, uh, that lasts centuries. Um, in the 21st century, and really in the last quarter uh, century since uh, the countries gained independence uh, from the Soviet Union, the Russian Empire, uh, the U.S. interests have been clear. Uh, we have actively worked with Azerbaijan and our other South Caucasus partners towards a secure, democratic, peaceful, and prosperous Caucasus region free from malign foreign influence. And since we established diplomatic relations with Azerbaijan in 1992, Azerbaijan has been an important partner of the U.S. Our relationship matters not just to our two countries, but to Azerbaijan's neighbors, and I've seen several representatives of the neighbors here today, and to the wider region. The strategic partnership between Azerbaijan and the United States is built on a foundation of a number of shared interests. Our priorities have been centered on three interrelated and equally important areas energy and economic growth, and I don't think there's anyone better than Dick Morningstar to talk about that, security, and democratic governance. The U.S. is also deeply engaged as a co-chair in what is known as the Minsk process under the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe to peacefully resolve the Nogrona Karabakh conflict. We've had a number of high-level reciprocal visits in recent months, including Ambassador Bolton visiting in October. And President Trump has exchanged several rounds of letters with President Aliyev, most recently on the occasion of the Caspian Oil and Gas Exhibition last month in May. On those energy and economic issues, the U.S. was a strong supporter of the completion of the Southern Gas Corridor as a significant contribution not only to Azerbaijan's economic prosperity, but European energy security. We've also supported Azerbaijan's efforts to diversify its economy in furtherance of an economically vibrant Azerbaijan fully integrated into the international community. And I had a great time last month going up north uh, to a fruit country and visited both uh, apple orchards and uh, hazelnut growers. So that was uh, interesting to see how uh, the economy is diversifying, including with uh, international cooperation. On security cooperation, we welcome Azerbaijan's contributions to NATO's mission in Afghanistan and the support against the fight against terrorism. On democratic governance, the U.S. continues to encourage all steps towards systemic reforms in Azerbaijan, especially in the rule of law and on the protection of human rights and fundamental freedoms. And I bet you Tom Melia is going to have a question for you, Hikmat, so be ready. Um, both areas, in our view, will benefit the Ar Azerbaijani people and create opportunities to deepen our cooperation. Finally, uh, the U.S. considers the peaceful settlement of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict to be a high priority and we may remain fully committed to the Minsk group process. We believe that resolution of this conflict is essential for achieving a secure and prosperous future for both Azerbaijan and Armenia. Uh, my colleague, the U.S. co-chair Andrew Schofer, was just in the region with his fellow co-chairs 
uh, to follow up on a series of high-level meetings with uh, at the leader and the foreign minister level. Our work to resolve this long-standing conflict will continue to be based on the principles of the non-use of force or threat of force, territorial integrity, and equal rights and self-determination of peoples. I will now hand off the conversation to Ambassador Morningstar and Mr. Hajiyev, who is a thoughtful and capable di diplomat uh, with whom we, the U.S. government, and I personally have had the pleasure of working with in several different roles, and in his current role as foreign policy advisor to President Aliyev. So thank you for coming, and please <coughs> come up to stage. Is it working? Uh, I'm here. Okay. Can you? Is it? It's working now. Good. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, it's a great pleasure for me to be able to moderate this discussion, having served in Azerbaijan between 2012 and 2014. I had the pleasure of working with Hikmat during that period when he was the press spokesperson at the uh, foreign ministry, and you know I know you sat in many discussions that I had with a foreign minister. Uh, and we called uh, it firefighter's office. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, your role, you have an incredibly important role today. Uh, I said to Ekman before, you're in effect the national security advisor for Azerbaijan, and you didn't deny it. Uh, <clears throat> so let's, uh, let's get right into the, uh, uh, the questions. I also might say before, it's a great crowd. Uh, <laughs> there are a lot of people here, so that's that's really <laughs> great, and it shows it shows the shows the interest. First, uh, you know, let, you heard uh, you heard George. Uh, do you have any comments or responses to what George said, and then we can get into more specific questions? Yeah. <clears throat> First of all, Ambassador Morningstar, thank you for this opportunity, and ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor and privilege to be back to Washington D.C and to have you know, this discussion about the Azerbaijan's foreign policy and Azerbaijan's standing in the region of South Caucasus. And I would just pro would like to provide you a couple of the sound bites about the Azerbaijan's foreign policy priorities. And of course, I will also appreciate the possibility that we can have an open discussion and constructive dialogue. <coughs> uh, what's a good thing is that I don't have any prepared any, uh, speech because press officers, I was previous press officer of the foreign minister, we always come up with a written uh, language. But in this case, I don't have anything in written. Uh, first of all, about the Azerbaijan's foreign policy. Uh, I would like to characterize or uh, conceptualize it in the context of four M's. What does it mean? What does it stand for? M number one is a multivectoralism in Azerbaijan's foreign policy. M number two is a multilateralism. M number three is a multi-regionalism. M number four is a multiculturalism. In a sense, we saw the four directions that characterize Azerbaijan's foreign policy, and also basic tenets of Azerbaijan's foreign policy is also independent, predictable, logical. Let me start with the just first M, multivectorial. Azerbaijan's geopolitical realities dictate that Azerbaijan should have a multivectorial policy. First of all, with the neighbors, and are we having a big neighbors, with whom Azerbaijan managed to build constructive dialogue and effective cooperation, and also Central Asian countries along the Caspian Sea. And we have uh, great powers like uh, China, United States, European Union, and with whom we have also managed to establish good relations. And then comes multilateralism. Multilateralism, of course, Azerbaijan is a relatively small country. And as a small country, we believe to the rule of law, international relations. Not just rule of law within the countries, but rules-based international order is extremely important. And therefore, we uh, actively engage with international organizations and international institutions. And also, within uh, multilateral diplomacy, we also pursue our national interests. And then multi-regionalism. Multi within multi-regionalism, Azerbaijan's approach, I would rather call it variable geometry. We are bringing different regions through the cooperation and building the elements of the connectivity. Just one example, <coughs> Southern Gas Corridor. Seven countries are cooperating along the route, completely different regions. 
South Caucasus, Balkans, Middle East, Europe, all of them are coming together along the wrong routes. And we are, along with the routes, uh, creating opportunities for cooperation, prosperity, and regional connectivity, and also contributing to the energy security of Europe. And of course, within the multi-regionalism, Azerbaijan derives from the principle of regional responsibility, regional ownership, and regional cooperation. <coughs> Fourth element, multiculturalism. And we are proud of multicultural nature of Azerbaijani society. And multiculturalism, as it was said by my president, it's not a, it's not a government policy. It's also a way of life of Azerbaijani people, where Azerbaijanis, Sunnis, Shias, Jews, some other ethnicities are living side by side in peace and dignity, not just today, for centuries. And Azerbaijan also promotes these values at the international level. And therefore, we are a stronger uh, supporter of uh, dialogue of civilizations uh, at the global level. But of course, Azerbaijan has its own threat perceptions, challenges. And Azerbaijan's threat perception, sometimes it's a missing element. And we see that some of our partners don't fully understand threat perceptions of Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan's threat perception since the early days of Azerbaijan independence, it was one of the most complicated one. In a sense that Azerbaijan faced with the foreign military aggression where Azerbaijan's territories have been occupied. And we also have one of the biggest catastrophe of the Europe after the Second World War, one million refugees and IDPs. And also I always say to my uh, friends whenever we have a chat and talk, in order to understand an Azerbaijan, we should put it in, also in the comparative perspective. Where was Azerbaijan and where we are? Let's be frank, in the early 90s, Azerbaijan was maybe considered a failed state because different political groups were fighting with one another. An entire economy has been collapsed and different challenges and difficulties. But now look at it today, Azerbaijan. Standing on its feet and pursues effective regional cooperation and also builds bilateral or multilateral models of cooperation at the regional level. And also, once being a consumer of security, today Azerbaijan is a contributor to the security. Therefore, as regards the U.S.-Azerbaijan relations, I agree with George Kent that uh, our partnership is a strategic one. Azerbaijan uh, also is a reliable partner for the United States in the fight against terrorism and security cooperation, energy cooperation, and some other dimensions that we are closely cooperating. And I will stop here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Let me dig a little more into the strategic questions. Yes. Um, <clears throat> you know, when, when I was there, sort of I heard constantly from Azerbaijani officials of what a difficult geography you have and a difficult uh, strategic uh, balance that you have to maintain. I mean, I was always, it was always incredible to me that from Baku, you know, drive two hours to the north and you're in Dagestan, or two and a half hours, drive two hours to the south, you're in Iran, uh, caught between Russia and Iran, um, problems with respect to Nagorno-Karabakh, have a border with Turkey, uh, 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 sort of caught, I, I always felt that Azerbaijan was on a tightrope <laughs> and was trying to balance all these relationships. How? How would you describe that, and how do you think you're doing in balancing the relationships? You know, given some of the, you know, problems today between the United States and Russia, for example, or the United States and Iran, can you maintain? Uh, can you maintain uh, that balance? And speaking of Iran, uh, how do you maintain a relationship with Iran and have a good relationship which you have with Israel? Uh, so. You, you are tightrope walkers, and how successful do you think you are doing that, and uh, do you think you can continue in that vein? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Ambassador. Especially, I would like to start with the last point, that you made Azerbaijan's good cooperation with Israel and having a neighborhood with Iran. Sometimes we ask this question, what's the secret of Azerbaijan's diplomacy, that you have with good relations at the same time? What I will say that it's, first of all, Azerbaijan has an independent foreign policy and predictability, and also we pursue uh, our policy based on the national interests of Azerbaijan. And in this difficult geography, we try to understand our neighbors, and also we also ask our neighbors to understand our realities. <clears throat> Here, uh, historically, Azerbaijan, you are right, that wasn't a battle space of big powers, like in a Belgium in Europe. Different empires were fighting with one another. 
And it was also a case when in 1918, uh, during, after the uh, First World War, Azerbaijan established as an Azerbaijan Democratic Republic, we have also seen great power of rivalry. And finally, Azerbaijan lost its independence. If in 1991, when Azerbaijan got its independence, we came to conclusion that gaining the independence is difficult, to maintaining the independence and making a success story yet another big challenge. Therefore, I believe Azerbaijan has managed to change this paradigm. We made Azerbaijan marketplace of great powers, rather than making Azerbaijan was on a battle place of big powers. At the regional level, uh, I'm, uh, I can say that Azerbaijan have a very effective cooperation with all three its neighbors, and especially Turkey, uh, Russia, and Iran. And Azerbaijan's fundamental principles in our relations with our neighbors, we derive from the non-interference in our internal affairs, and mutual respect, and also mutually beneficial cooperation and also strategic dialogue. Uh, being a relatively small country, and of course such an imbalanced foreign policy doesn't come so easily, but as, uh, as I told, we are actively supporting this one of the aims that I uh, elaborated a little bit, multivectorialism. And a multivectorial policy of Azerbaijan, immediate neighbors is one of the priorities. And of course, within that process, Azerbaijan also builds in as an effective cooperation with the United States, but we are a reliable partner, and also some other partners. How would, again, do manage it? Independent foreign policy and transparent foreign policy and predictable foreign policy. And in that process also we should take into account that Azerbaijan is a self-sufficient country. And Azerbaijan doesn't depend on anyone. And we are also always saying that we are not burdened on our partners. We are not asking anything except mutual beneficial cooperation that serves the interests of Azerbaijani people and interests of our partners. Just one example, Southern Gas Corridor or connectivity projects that Azerbaijan is building, east and west, north source, is a real examples that provides opportunities for the regional cooperation. We also do believe that best prosperity is a shared prosperity. Azerbaijan shares its own prosperity with the neighbors and contributing to the regional peace and security. Let me uh, uh, get into the uh, sort of the elephant, it's always the elephant in the room in the Gornokarabakh question. Uh, <clears throat> and and get some you know get some thoughts on that. I think from an overall standpoint, there probably is not an Azerbaijani nor an Armenian nor anybody anywhere else that wouldn't say that a resolution of this issue would be good for Azerbaijan and it would be good for Armenia. The problem, you know, it's 25 years and there's still been no uh, resolution. I remember when I went off to Baku. Uh, Hillary Clinton, who was then Secretary of State, said to me, your job is to keep these two from starting a real war. Uh, and that, <clears throat> that as far as getting it resolved, I've always felt, and I don't mean to be giving a speech, but it's a sort of set of context from what you're saying, that it was very difficult, uh, that, that politically it was very difficult for both sides because any kind of compromise each side was, go was going to lose something. On the Azerbaijani side, compromise, some kind of compromise on Nagorno-Karabakh. On the Armenian side, politically very difficult uh, to give, give up territories, whatever one might think about whether they should be in the territories to begin with. But in any event, very, very difficult politically on both sides. I also thought it was very difficult because I'm not sure what Russia's intentions really are. And it seems to me that Russia could well be happy to have this dispute going on forever without maybe a hot war, but a situation where they can maintain the most leverage over both countries. Given what I'm saying, uh, you may agree or disagree. If you disagree, tell me or tell us. How does it ever get resolved? <coughs> Ambassador, yeah. it's a uh, fundamental issue and uh, Armenia-Azerbaijan-Nagorno-Karabakh conflict undermines regional peace and security. It also fragments the region as a result of which we don't have a full-fledged regional cooperation. And Armenia suffers and Azerbaijan suffers as well. And as a result of which conflict, more than 25 years, people of two countries are suffering. Imagine that in the 21st century, in Europe, we have in a First World War scenario trenches along the trenches, hundreds of thousands of soldiers sitting in the trenches and facing one another. There's a potentiality for escalation at any time. We always say to our Armenian uh, counterparts that, what do you have achieved as a result of this conflict? My answer is that simply nothing. 
let's look at the real facts on the ground. As a result of this conflict, Armenia become a self-isolated country in the region. And Armenia has a big demographic issues and challenges. During the Soviet time, Armenia's external transport routes, 80% of Armenia's transportation runs through the territory of Azerbaijan. And we can play this role again. Every country is in normal terms. 50% foreign trade or regional cooperation falls in the share of the neighboring countries. You don't have any cooperation with Azerbaijan and Turkey. And then whatever you produce in Armenia, the price 30% is going to up because of the transportation issue. And also demographic issues and challenges. Poverty level in Armenia is beyond 40%. And as a result of which Armenian people, they give their own answer to the Sarkisian and Kocharian regime, and they change their government. And this, we always said that this crisis was inevitable. Sooner or later it's going to happen. And how to get out from the deadlock situation? I always use an example of Georgian Azerbaijan cooperation. It's a role model. The biggest investors in Georgia are Azerbaijan companies. Biggest taxpayers in Georgia are Azerbaijan companies. Sokar. Yeah, Sokar. <laughs> Some others as well. And Azerbaijan sends 1.5 million tourists to Georgia. Maybe it's difficult for American companies come to invest in Georgia, but it's much easier for Azerbaijan companies to do it. Can we do the same with Armenia? Of course we can do it. I said best prosperity is a shared prosperity. But why we can't do it, that's an unfair question to answer. It's also questions that Armenian society should answer to these questions. One and fundamental issue, what do we have? We have fundamental fact of occupation. Azerbaijan's territory is occupied. And we have also one million refugees. Let's be frank and open. I'm also seeing with Armenian community members here. I'm also looking forward to really this opportunity to have a talk with them. One cannot build its own happiness based on the tragedy of others. Human rights are universal one. We have Armenian community in Nagorno-Karabakh. Do they have a right to live in Nagorno-Karabakh? Of course they have. But also we have Azerbaijani community. You cannot violate Azerbaijani community's right to have only exclusive rights to the Armenian community. What's the answer? Two communities can and should live in peace and dignity. And as a result of which, we will have a full-fledged regional cooperation between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Again, returning to the fundamental issue here is the fact of military occupation. Let's the soldiers go to the barracks. Under the Battle of Ghan, we can't talk about the peace. And Nagorno-Karabakh, and we have seven regions outside of Nagorno-Karabakh. It's four times bigger than Nagorno-Karabakh. And 700,000 Azerbaijanis are forcefully expelled, especially from these areas. Do they have a right to return back to their home? Of course. And do they have to exercise their right of property? And of course. What is our approach? Conflict is too complicated. There is no easy answer. Within one package, we cannot solve everything. What is the fundamental approach? It's also part of the Madrid principles. Of course, we are not fully satisfied. You talk about the compromise. I agree with you. Both sides should make a compromise. And we are also making our compromise as well. Madrid principles, one of the elements that Armenian troops should be withdrawn from the regions outside of Nagorno-Karabakh as a first stage. For example, maybe five regions, two plus three. Some other variations could be. And then Azerbaijan's IDPs and refugees are back. Our first success of our first step can make success of our next steps. And as a follow up, we can have a step, step by step approach to the conflict. Sometimes I call it 6D plan. In a sense that first we should start with the deoccupation, demilitarization. For example, Armenian side always says that Armenian community in Nagorno Karabakh, they have security concerns. Okay. Fine, they can have the security concerns, but let's sit together as a normal people to discuss, including the elements of the demilitarization. Then, the mining, I put it in the wider context, because all areas, is a ghost towns around Nagorno-Karabakh, including in Nagorno-Karabakh itself, everything is destroyed. The mi mining problems over there, some other infrastructure problems. Then I call it deployment. IDPs and refugees should back to their homes. And then dialogue. Let's have a bigger dialogue between Armenia and Azerbaijan or wider Armenian and Azerbaijan communities all around the world. And then we have finally full-fledged development. It's a win-win situation. We should choose eternal war or eternal peace. I'm proponent of the eternal peace. This conflict when started, I was an early teenager. It was early 90s. And a couple of years ago, I was in Oxford University. My counterpart was an Armenian diplomat. I told him that we are the same age. When the conflict started, we were just teenagers. But 25 years older than the past, we are now, in a sense, old gentlemen in our 40s. Our generation is changing, but conflict persists. It means that 
10 years later, our sons will sit in the trench, look at one another through the binoculars. Is it a future that we would like to build in the region? Of course not. If we sit together and we always said, let's have a substantive talks. When political change happened in Armenia, and Pashinyan came to power, and we said, at that time I was a spokesperson of the foreign ministry, that with the new government of Armenia, we think that if it's in a constructive policy pursuit, we can make a success in the resolution of the conflict. And, for example, there was some concerns from Armenian side. We said that, okay, let's play our role as well. And my president in a Dushanbe CIS meeting, and they had a chat uh, with Armenian prime minister, said that, okay, three elements, continuation of the talks, ceasefire reinfor reinforcement, or establishing certain kind of hotline uh, at operational level. All of them have been planned, uh, settled. Then Armenian side said that we have an election in the parliament. Okay, in a sense, it's understandable. They should settle down internal issues. And then started 2019, we said that we are ready to engage substantive talks. Let's sit together to discuss all difficult issues. But unfortunately, now we say that Armenian side said was now, as a conditions negotiation process, Nagorno-Karabakh should be part of the conflict. Then I can, you know, the legal framework and who are the conflicting parties, uh, this is a well established. Because simply, Armenian armed forces are physically present in territories of Azerbaijan. In terms of the international law, it makes Armenian side as a responsible party to the conflict. You cannot deny this responsibility. But if you are talking about the Armenian community of Nagorno-Karabakh, of course we have Azerbaijan community of Nagorno-Karabakh as well. 80,000 people. Do they have a right? Of course they are humans as well. They also have a right. And with communities, we always encourage inter-community dialogue. We do think that it's a one of the fundamental elements of ethnic reconciliation between Armenians and Azerbaijanis, especially in Nagorno-Karabakh. I'm sure, I'm a great believer that tomorrow in Khankandi, in Shusha, and some other cities, Armenians and Azerbaijanis live side by side. But let's start this process now. But unfortunately, just yesterday, Azerbaijan soldier was killed on the line of contact. Armenian Defense Minister Tanoyan, whom I know when I served out of a delegation to NATO, and he even decorated and awarded Armenian soldier who killed Azerbaijan soldier. That's in a peace negotiation that we want to, want to pursue further. And Tanoyan was here in the United States and said that new wars and new territories, as if Armenian side will grab new territories of Azerbaijan. What does it mean? This is a reality. Therefore, it's a fundamental issues. Really, Armenian people in Armenia should answer this question as well. Here comes another element uh, I'm looking forward to this opportunity. Armenian diaspora. Armenian diaspora is a little bit different from Armenian lobby. Armenian diaspora is a lot of people with all due respect and, uh, you know. But Armenian, some Armenian lobby groups, especially in the Western countries, my always question to them that sometimes your policy that you are pursuing is not effective. It's uh, unconstructive. You are pushing Armenia towards an enmity based on the certain historical interpretations. Look at Armenia currently, 40% of poverty, mountainous geography, <clears throat> no economic perspectives, there is no concrete investment, and borders are closed. Okay, as a lobby group, how you are going to contribute to Armenia's peace? Armenia deserves to have a good relation with the neighbors, but good relation with the neighbors also requires that you fulfill your commitments. Yeah, <coughs> sorry for being too long. No, that's okay. I mean, I think you stated the Azerbaijani position well. There may be some responses to it. Uh, but let me ask you this. One of the things that, you know, I felt, again, being in Azerbaijan, and I, I don't know if it's true or not, uh, I sort of felt that the older generation were not as, what's the right word, you know, were more, maybe more pragmatic than the younger generation as far as a resolution because they had lived during a period where Azerbaijanis and Armenians had actually lived together. No. Whereas today, in both Armenia and Azerbaijan, young people are only hearing what they're taught in the schools and uh, and question being, are they actually more uh, more resistant yeah. uh, towards uh, real constructive negotiations than older people, or is that wrong? I would have hoped that younger people would say, and you seem to be saying, yeah, 25 years is long enough. You know, let's get this thing one way or another resolved. But is, am I right that younger people seem to be maybe even more on both sides uh, more difficult with respect to getting it resolved, or not? 
Ambassador, you are right in what terms that there is a new generation in Armenia and Azerbaijan. This new generation, they grown up, they have never seen Armenian or other party have never seen Azerbaijani. And only narratives they have uh, heard about Azerbaijanis or Armenians uh, in Azerbaijani society, it was about a uh, conflict. Therefore, they don't know so much about uh, the uh, realities on the ground. Of course, I'm relatively you know, younger generation as well, as much as I can claim. Uh, but I am a great believer to the peace, of the peace. And I do believe that peace, eternal peace is possible between Armenian people and Azerbaijani people. But let's uh, give a chance to the peace. Do you? From, yeah. yeah. Do you, and to the last question I'll yeah. ask on NK, then yeah. I have one more question and we'll have plenty of time for the yeah. audience. Uh, <clears throat> now I'm trying to remember what, uh, what, my last, uh, what my last question was on NK. Uh, I did answer your question on Russia and co-chair's okay. role in the process. And yeah, I will elaborate on that as well. Was in yeah. the meantime. It's tough to get old yeah. anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, go ahead. I, yeah, go ahead. Uh, as a resolution for the conflict and the role of the co-chairs, really uh, Russia and United States and France are co-chair countries. And we know the roadmap. Everybody knows really how to resolve the conflict, including the Armenian side. In general, what is a philosophy? Philosophy is a land for peace. Or I would rather rephrase it, I would call it land for prosperity. Land for prosperity in a sense that, as I said, in the 60 plan, we are opening the broader cooperation between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And co-chairs are playing their role. But of course, expectation is always high because these three countries are permanent members of the UN Security Council. By book, book I don't mean Bible or Quran, I mean UN Charter of the United Nations. And they are responsible for the international peace and security. And they're playing the role, but of course more active engagement from the other side is also expected. Because uh, we also have so many challenges and difficulties in this region and this conflict makes Armenia and Azerbaijan both vulnerable to the potential risk comes from the wider region. And therefore, uh, uh, further, uh, you know, establishing a uh, uh, lasting peace between Armenia and Azerbaijan will also provide wider regional cooperation at the end of the day, strengthen the potential of two countries. And Minsk Group co-chairs, uh, they recently were in Azerbaijan and we had an extensive talks, and uh, they're looking forward to yet another meeting uh, at the level of the foreign ministers. But in general, uh, we are supporting substantive, intensive talks on the current agenda, and we appreciate the role of the Minsk Group co-chairs, but of course our expectation that they should redouble all the efforts. But one final point, recently with the funding of the European Union, Berlin Economics, that's an NGO uh, in uh, Germany, they made an interesting research about the economic, economic benefits of the conflict resolution for both Armenia and Azerbaijan. It was an excellent report, really. I even said my two AU colleagues that we encourage you, continue such projects. What one, one basic example says that if the conflict resolves at the initial stage, 2% from the GDP, two countries will win because GDP per capita defense spending in Armenia is a 4%. Uh, 4%. And immediately it will go down to 2%. And same true for Azerbaijan as well. Armenia can use transportation potential or connectivity project that have been pro Azerbaijan have been provided in the region. For example, uh, uh, Prime Minister Pashinyan talks about the economic agenda of Armenia. And he says that Nagorno-Karabakh conflict and economic prosperity development of Armenia are closely interlinked. I agree with him, are closely interlinked. One even, I would rather say, but one dependent on another, on another one. If the conflict resolves, it really will bring a lot of benefits to the Armenian people, first of all, and also provide excellent opportunities for wider regional cooperation. I remember my last question on yeah. NK. Um, one of the, one of the uh, uh, concerns that I've always had, maybe I'm being naive, I think all these principles that people talk about is basically pretty useless. You know, the Madrid principles <laughs> and this and that and all the other things. What <clears throat> that, that the various con various uh, you know meetings that have taken place over over the years, um, you've said some I think some very constructive things as part of what you've described. Why shouldn't and maybe you're saying this a little bit with respect no. to your last comments? Why can't Armenians and Azerbaijanis at high level sit down with no preconditions, forget about what may have been in the past as far as principles and so forth, and just talk through why it's important after 25 years to get it done and what steps can be taken to get it done. And just start fresh. 
Is that just being naive or crazy, or is that something that could work? Ambassador, it's a good idea. Really, we always said that, first of all, Baku needs, and Yerevan, Baku, and needs to talk to one another. First of all, Azerbaijan and Armenian people, we need a peace. Co-chairs and their role, playing their role, and international community, and so on. But first fundamental question should be asked by Armenia and Azerbaijan. And exactly in the context that you have said, my president demonstrated it's a constructive attitude in Dushanbe in September. There wasn't a direct talk without interference of the co-chairs and anyone else. Azerbaijan president, Armenian prime minister talked to one another, and they agreed on the certain issues, including reinforcement of the ceasefire regime and some other issues. It seems that when negotiations can bring the results, when there is a good face, and good face negotiations can bring the results, really. And therefore, we do we are, believe that between Yerevan and Baku and such kind of talks can bring its results. But of course, we also appreciate international communities' contribution, including the OSC Minsk Group co-chairs. But of course, you know, there are fundamental issues needs to be answered by Armenian people as well in general. You know, 19th century feudal mentality that occupying other countries' territories that will bring benefit to you, no, it's not going to work. Territorial expansion, uh, this kind of stuff, is not an answer to the 21st century. But unfortunately, what we see, for example, Azerbaijan demonstrates in a constructive attitude reinforcement of the ceasefire regime, we see also illegal activities. For example, in Fuzili, uh, some Armenians from Syria have been settled. My question, have ever Armenians lived in Fuzili region of Azerbaijan? What about the 100,000 Azerbaijanis who lived over there and who have been ethnically cleansed? These are also the issues. Well, all of these things yeah. we talked about. Exactly. Get, let me move to one other area, and then we'll get to the audience. Uh, in the energy area, since, yeah. <laughs> since that was a role I played a lot, I had a big role in. Uh, what do you see as the future of the Southern Corridor? Uh, do you see expansion of projects in Azerbaijan? Do you think that a Transcaspian gas pipeline is really feasible? Uh, many people here have heard me say it's never going to happen during my lifetime, <laughs> but I'm getting old, so I'm getting worried about it. Uh, so, so yeah. <laughs> I've been saying this for the last 20 years, but now I'm no. 74 years old, so I'm like, oh, no, God. <laughs> <You know? Right. laughs> I'll get really worried if it gets close. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, but, but seriously, um, how, do, uh, how do you see the future with respect to the Southern Corridor? Ambassador, first of all, thank you for your contributions to the development of the energy uh, projects of Azerbaijan. And the, since the early 90s, United States government, uh, as a uh, U.S. government representative, you contributed a lot. Really, we do appreciate that. Uh, without United States support, Azerbaijan, uh, you know, uh, will not be able to uh, transport its natural resources and also build in a different energy projects and also networks of the pipelines that brought a lot of prosperity, elements of the cooperation uh, to the region. Uh, Southern Gas Corridor, uh, things are going well and uh, within the schedule. Uh, as you know, Southern Gas Corridor consists of the first four components. Shahtan is two projects, it's already finalized. Now, as a TANAP concept, that the Trans Anatolian Pipeline is also finalized, and Southern Gas Corridor, uh, South, South Caucasus Gas Corridor has been finalized. Now we have a fourth element that's in a top project, and things are going well. And uh, we do believe that within the uh, time frame that have been established, it's going to be finalized as an alternative source. An alternative roof energy is going to contribute to the Europe's energy security. But most importantly, already along the route, I talked about the variable geometry or multi-regionalism that Azerbaijan prefers and uh, effectively promotes. 50,000 jobs have been created. 50,000 jobs. It's also contribution to the countries that uh, are located along the route. We always say that uh, in energy projects of Azerbaijan, we take into interest of the exporters, transit countries, and importers as well. Simply, it's a, a beneficial cooperation for everyone. As regards the Transcaspian uh, pipeline issue or uh, further uh, development on that uh, uh, context, really, Ambassador, uh, what we say always, in this situation, Azerbaijan is a transit country. Let's say importers and exporters come to the conclusion, make their strategic decisions, we are ready to support it. But as a transit country, we are ready to play our role. But of course, in this case, again, importers and exporters should make their strategic decision. But beyond the energy, 
Azerbaijan is building also along, uh, uh, along with the partners and friendly countries, <coughs> uh, East-West Corridor. And East-West Corridor, we call it a uh, restoration of the ancient Silk Road. Even there are four components of the ancient Silk Road. Airports, new airports, Azerbaijan has six new airports. And uh, railway, we call it Iron Silk Road. Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Turkey's railway system has been uh, linked. That's called Baku Tbilisi Cars Railway System. And also, Azerbaijan, just during the last 15 years, 15,000 kilometers uh, new roads have been created and established in Azerbaijan. And also, we call it fourth element, uh, telecommunication component, where private sector of Azerbaijan, along with the Central Asian countries and some other friendly countries, we are establishing fiber optic new routes, bringing, and, uh, uh, bringing together China and European countries. Therefore, on connectivity projects, we are working actively well. We making Azerbaijan as a landlocked country, transforming Azerbaijan from landlocked country into a land-linked country. And uh, because uh, such a cooperation with our neighbors also provides outsourcing capacity for Azerbaijan because we don't have an access to sea, but our neighbors and partners have a sea. We are providing our possibilities and opportunities. We are also getting benefited from our partners as a result of which is a win-win situation. Just one example. Uh, according to the estimation, uh, trade, uh, annual trade between China and Europe, 500 million euros uh, version of cargo. As middle corridor, Central Asian countries and Azerbaijan, we can also play our role, and already we are playing, and some cargoes are already passing Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan, Caspian Sea, Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Turkey. That's another. And we're also working, of course, on North Source Corridor as well, but current American-Iranian uh, relations context, you know, some difficulties and challenges. But North Source Corridor also has a potential to bring two oceans together. We call it Indian Ocean and Atlantic Ocean together. Just, you know, uh, in the comparative perspective, one shipment from uh, India or uh, Indian Ocean via Suez Channel reaches in Northern Europe within, you know, two months or 40 days. But we are railway system that can link Bandar Abbas, Iran, Azerbaijan, and St. Petersburg port, it takes 14 days. Time is money. It means that, you know, with the connectivity projects, we can build different markets together, and as a result of which our partners can benefit, and we can benefit as well. And we also see the role for Armenia as well in this process, but with the resolution of the conflict. Uh, let me ask you this, and then I'll <laughs> turn it over. Yeah. China. Why don't you say a word about Azerbaijan's relationship with China, projects that, Oz that China is doing, that part of the links that, that you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, how, you know, the importance, a lot of countries are finding, you know, it's great that China has all this money that it wants to invest, but then they invest the money and countries have problems as a result of it. Uh, uh, what Azerbaijan is doing to make sure that whatever deals are made with China, that it ultimately makes long-term sense for Azerbaijan. Ambassador, I'm using the Huawei phone. I'm concerned about an uh, update of <laughs> the program. They may be listening. <laughs> they better be, you know. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but with the China, uh, especially uh, One Belt, One Road initiative, uh, because for us, One Belt, One Road initiative, it resonates well with the ancient concept of the Silk Road, because historically Azerbaijan was on the part of the Silk Road, and therefore, within one, bolt, one Belt, One Road initiative, especially as a connectivity component, seems quite attractive for Azerbaijan, as already elaborated, that we see a lot of cargo potential between China and Europe, where we can provide our transit and transport role, because Azerbaijan is becoming transport hub with its uh, new ports, airports, and so on. As regards with China, we have uh, you know, uh, effective cooperation with China, and based on the mutual respect, and recently, uh, my president was in China in the second One Belt, One Road initiative. Uh, uh, Azerbaijan's perspective is a little bit different. Within One Belt, One Road initiative, there are some programs proposed by Chinese government for infrastructure developments and so on. It's up to the Chinese government and other governments to do. But what is Azerbaijan's perspective is that we already have our own infrastructure. If it's about the connectivity, it's, if it's about the transportation and economic cooperation and bringing different regions together, yes, Azerbaijan is ready to play its role. And again, variable geometry. And within this variable geometry, we are playing our role of bringing different seas together. Once we linked Caspian Sea with the Black Sea, then we linked Black Sea with the Mediterranean Sea. Now, even we are going beyond and linking the fourth sea, that's an Adriatic Sea. Along this route, you see the elements of the cooperation, 
prosperity. And uh, I'm glad to say that Azerbaijan is getting contributed and effectively contributes to this process as well. Thank you. OK, let's open it up to the audience. I would, when, when you speak, please, please identify yourself. Uh, and I know that there are, there are you know, contentious issues, so I'd ask there not, be, there not be speeches, but more you know, quick comments and questions. Uh, I see my good friend, former Ambassador Kozlerich over there. Hi, Rich Kozlerich from George Mason University. Yeah, um, glad and you're former here. ambassador to Oslo. Well, right? that was. Yeah. Well, yeah, I was a student I, when you delivered the speech at Baku State ago. University. Yeah. That's when you were the a teenager. <laughs> yeah, it was a teenager time. Yeah, <laughs> that time you were the good ambassador, contributed yeah. to U.S. Azerbaijan relations. Um, my question really goes starts with the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict and the need to prepare societies, both in Armenia and Azerbaijan, for yeah. peace. Yes. Uh, and in order to do that, it requires a certain ability for people to express themselves. And regrettably, in Azerbaijan, over the last two decades, the human rights situation has not improved. Uh, people, including in the political opposition, are being accused of working for Armenia. Uh, you have less freedom of expression, uh, independent media. And in particular, the ability to travel is limited. How do you get a society to move from seeing the other as only as an enemy, to being able to debate the real issues that you've identified that are going to have to be resolved. Um, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Ambassador, time by time I see your tweets and comments on Azerbaijan. Uh, I don't find them quite fair. But of course, we also respect freedom of opinion. It's up to you and uh, your freedom of expression. But uh, when it comes to really, uh, first of all, freedom of expression in Azerbaijan, figures are speaking for themselves. 80% of Azerbaijani population having access 4G internet. And social media, all social media are fully operational in Azerbaijan. And I would encourage anyone to go, if you speak Azerbaijani language, Brenda Shafar speaks, go to social media of Azerbaijan and check what kind of discussions, or vibrant discussion or dynamic discussion going on over there. Sometimes even without any sense of responsibility, you can say criticism against anyone or everyone in Azerbaijan. And therefore, you know, we simply have in a social media space or media, uh, social media, including the media space, there is a vibrant discussion. I was in a press officer of the foreign ministry, and on a daily basis, I responded eight questions, eight zero questions from Azerbaijani media only. Sometimes we uh, are ignoring one important element: five thousand people are working in the media industry in Azerbaijan. Sometimes we are picking up one, two, three, but forgetting about the forty thousand plus about the media representatives. Put it in the context of Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict, a recent statement of the Minsk Group co-chair said that preparation people for the peace. Yes, because the conflict calls for trauma and difficulties in both societies. Wars are not so easy. Therefore, preparation for the people for the peace, track to diplomacy or 1.5 diplomacy, different ideas have been discussed. One of the elements that we always encourage, as I already said, is an inter-community dialogue we can start from the small steps because emotions are too high. For example, one of the recent examples was that let's start about the journalists and Armenian and Azerbaijani journalists can visit one another with all due respect because journalists' job is about the reporting. I'm a little bit concerned that it can add to the rhetoric. Therefore, situation or negotiation process is so fragile. We should very carefully approach to the issue, not to destroy in everything. But in general, as an inter-community dialogue, what I say tomorrow, Azerbaijani uh, and Armenian, and they should live in Khan Kandy, in Shusha, and some other cities. And therefore, Azerbaijani community of Nagorno-Karabakh is ready. And we also asked our international partners, and yesterday I asked different American and United States institutions as well, if you can, please support with initiatives that we can have inter-community dialogue. Let's start from the small steps. And based on the small steps, we can step by step build some success. Let me follow up, on, you know, and I don't want to get into a debate on how open Azerbaijani society is or isn't. But again, this is a generational question, and, you, and there's, a, again, a, a whole generation of younger people coming along who really are used to the social media and so forth. And there's already, I mean, and you may be in just one generation before that, being a, <laughs> basically a young guy, but more and more, young, more and more younger people. Is that is there a push 
for more openness because of as this as the newer generation comes along. Well, Ambassador, <coughs> Azerbaijan is a path of the democratic development. It's a strategic choice of Azerbaijan government. And everybody knows that uh, you know, there is a one, not on a one single model of the democracy. And we also have in a post-Soviet space, and post-Soviet space has its own realities. And I, in the beginning of my speech, I said that let's put in everything in the comparative perspective, where we were, and where we are, and where we are moving. Just 25 years ago, in Baku, Azerbaijan was in almost in a failed state. Different political groups were fighting with one another. And there was a three hours running electricity in the central streets of Baku. Yeah? And there was in a long bread queues. I was myself, was in a teenager, standing in the long bread queues. That is the realities of Azerbaijan 25 years ago. And you see now Azerbaijan mid-income country. Poverty in Azerbaijan 15 years ago, just more than 50%, 50 It's not poverty, it's a less than 4% as a mid-income European country. An entire budget of Azerbaijan was 500 million US dollars. Now Azerbaijan has its sovereign wealth fund beyond 40, person, uh, 40 billion US dollars. It's a transparent system in the state oil fund of Azerbaijan. Everyone can check. Currently, Azerbaijan government and my president have a strategic vision of transformation of Azerbaijan. And every country needs a reform on a regular basis. Look at the taxation system of Azerbaijan. It has been completely changed. Look at the public services. I would say that even Azerbaijan public service uh, system is one of the best in the world. Because we also know the Soviet uh, system of bureaucracy, how it worked with the bribery, corruption. We call it Asan system, easy. In Azerbaijan language, it means you know, easy. Under one umbrella, more than 150 public services have been provided. Just, I get recently my driver's license. Two minutes, 30 seconds. Just paying your card, uh, paying your payment uh, with a bank card, and so on. You see what? tremendous transformations are going in Azerbaijan, not only in the financial sector and public sector, in some other spheres as well. And new technocrats and bureaucrats, a generation of the bureaucrats are also uh, you know, developed uh, in Azerbaijan as well. Therefore, I see the future is so bright. And as in every country, there is no perfect country. We are not claiming for perfection, as everybody is learning. In this process, we are open for the constructive dialogue with all our partners. Sometimes, unfortunately, we see stereotypical approach towards an Azerbaijan, unfair, elements of the propaganda, elements of the hybrid war. Uh, everything is in black and white. There are many colors between black and white. And therefore, we should also you know, appreciate and understand, and also understand geopolitical realities of Azerbaijan. Without understanding geopolitical realities, we cannot make fair conclusions. Geopolitical realities also Azerbaijan is that as a majority Muslim society, but it's a secular. It's a secular not by constitution, it's a secular by way of life. Where Sunnis and Shias are going to the same mosque. Where in the majority Muslim society every day, without any discrimination, without any segregation, I take my 10 years old daughter to the school. And along some other young girls and she's going to the school. And this is the reality of Azerbaijan. Just 15 years, 3,000 schools have been built and renovated in Azerbaijan. 600 new hospitals have been built and renovated in Azerbaijan. But also our facts talking about the, because human rights concept, we should have an integral approach. There is a political aspects of the human rights, social, economic, some other aspects of the human rights should also be considered so that to understand a broader approach. Unemployment, less than a 4% in my country. And I can continue the list. There are also a lot of positive signs, and we should appreciate and understand the wider picture. Yeah, I agree with you. It's not black and white. But, and also, do you, but I take it you feel that as generations come along, that that's having a positive effect on the transformations that are taking place or will hopefully will continue to take place. Yeah, but the world is changing, yeah. and Azerbaijan is changing as well. New technologies and affect them and every each country and Azerbaijan as well. Okay. Lots, oh, lots of hands. I don't know where to, <laughs> I, I, I don't know where to go. Uh, there are about ten hands up. Uh, actually, I see Bob Bradkey back there, and so I'll uh, let Ambassador. Not that I'm being biased towards ambassadors, but uh, <laughs> former Minsk Group coach. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah. I was. They are the, getting older as well. Huh? <laughs> okay. We all are. Uh, I mean, was interested in your comments about the step-by-step -step process that yeah. Azerbaijan sees as offering a path forward. 
And I wonder whether you could foresee, as part of that process, at the end of that process, or toward the end of that process, that the people of Nagorno-Karabakh would have the opportunity to decide what their future should be and where their future should lie. <clears throat> First, Ambassador, let's uh, you know, double check the terminology. In Nagorno-Karabakh, we have Armenian population that used to be and continues to be for us the citizens of Azerbaijan. And in Nagorno-Karabakh, we also had the Azerbaijani community. And also, as I told, human rights is an integral process. You cannot discriminate one group and only give an exclusive right to another group. Currently, the number of the Azerbaijani community is 80,000. Step-by-step approach. Conflict is, as you know, even in the process, is very complicated. When uh, Kozlarich, Mr. Kozlarich was an ambassador of the United States in Baku, US, Emba US Embassy in Azerbaijan, they organized a regular TOEFL, Test of English as a Foreign Language Trainings for Azerbaijani students. I still remember one recommendation from our student, uh, from our professor. She said that when you have a difficult questions in the process, don't concentrate too much on them. Do the things that you can. If you concentrate too much on the difficult things, you will fail in the exam. I still remember that. In the conflict, status is one of the difficult issues. It's uh, quite sensitive. Therefore, let's start from the things that we can do. Things that we can do. We have in the regions outside of Nagorno-Karabakh, region of Azerbaijan, that's in the ghost towns, completely destroyed. Armenian troops can be withdrawn, and we can start, as I told you, 60 plan, the development, and so on. Then we'll have a strategic dialogue between Armenian and Azerbaijan confidence building measures, and so on. And within that context, and also with the involvement of Azerbaijani community of Nagorno-Karabakh, we can also look at the concept of the self-determination, but of course, Self-determination has its in a, uh, uh, you know, elements of the internal self-determination. Of course, as for Azerbaijan, territorial integrity and inviability of its internationally recognized borders is a fundamental issue, as in every other country. And within the boundaries of Azerbaijan, Armenian and Azerbaijani communities of Nagorno-Karabakh can exercise their right of self-determination. Recently, I was in Italy. Trentino Alto Adige, in the 60s, I talked to some of the friends and colleagues from Italian Foreign Ministry, and even Mario Raffaelli, he was first chair of the Minsk Group, founding father of the Minsk Group, we can say. He is originally from Trentino Alta Adige. In the 60s, there was a violence. Austrian, uh, German-speaking Austrians in uh, Trentino region sometimes were using force against the Italians, Italians using the force. But now, it is one of the most prosperous part and region of Italy with a zero unemployment. Can we do the same in Nagorno-Karabakh? Yes, I do believe that we can do it. But of course, in every each and every country, we are not, not asking something extraordinary. We are also not denying the rights of Armenians living in Nagorno-Karabakh. But we should also not deny rights of Azerbaijanis in, from Nagorno-Karabakh, including the rights of 7, 700,000 Azerbaijanis. But as my TOEFL, uh, uh, professor said, let's start from the things that we can do. And then on our way forward, we will see. The first success of our first step can guarantee success of our next step. Okay. Uh, the gentleman in the back. Thank you, Master. Uh, David Gregorian, Policy Forum Armenia. Uh, Mr. Ajiv, thank you very much for your insightful comments. Uh, I uh, particularly appreciate uh, your call to look at where Azerbaijan is today and where it was before and, and want to take you back and in some way turn the table around um, and basically ask you where Azerbaijan was before 1918 and what claims it had on, on Karabakh. Uh, the closest I think anyone with any knowledge of history would, uh, would come to uh, showing a claim of Azerbaijan on Karabakh would be Stalin's anti-Armenian policies of 1920s and 1930s. Uh, not even Soviet constitution, uh, which is, is not a international document by any measure of the, the stick, uh, out of which actually Nagorno-Karabakh used uh, successfully to leave Azerbaijan in, in 1988. So if you could please walk us through sort of, you know, you, you keep talking about concessions on the Armenian side. Why not forget the current situation. Why? You lost the war, you lost territories which never were yours to begin with. 
why not look past this current status quo and then advocate for economic benefits, where as an economist, I would agree with you beyond that point. Thank you. Um, Mr. Grigorian, thank you. I don't want to go into a historical debate about the Karabakh or Soviet constitutional law. I can uh, provide you with uh, hundreds of different counter arguments and saying that Nagorno-Karabakh, based even on the Soviet constitution, was and remained part of Azerbaijan. But it's a completely different story. I don't want to go into the historical details of Stalin. Even uh, that time, the decision was not to give Nagorno-Karabakh, but even in Russian language, uh, we can look at it. It says, it means that remains within Azerbaijan. Anyway, it's a historical part. We have what we have. Now, you are saying that the thing, let's be open, because you are saying that Azerbaijan should accept the fact of military occupation. Armenia, by use of force, occupied Nagorno-Karabakh and seven adjacent regions and 700,000 Azerbaijanis, and you are saying that, okay, fine, let's accept it. But would any other country accept that? Let's be realistic. And also, in the negotiation process, let's be open and frank. Try to understand Azerbaijanis as well. We also have our threat perception. And there was a lot of atrocities and war crimes and so on. Azerbaijanis have been expelled. And do they have a right to return back to their home? Yes. But also, in the 21st century, we are talking about changing internationally recognized borders by use of force. It means that we are returning back to the 30s and 40s. One country can say that I am so powerful, I can change any border, whatever I wish. Whatever, what's cause, what sort of the status quo we are establishing. Therefore, my approach, of course, is a, it's not an acceptable. Azerbaijan didn't lose in a war. <laughs> it was in a battle. Uh, of course, uh, you know, Azerbaijan believes, and we strongly believe that peaceful resolution, efforts for the peaceful resolution of the conflict are not exhausted. But as an economist, let's sit together and look into the future. And with the resolution of the conflict, and I do believe that there will be finally win-win situation for both countries. But current status is unacceptable for us. Understand our threat perception. It's also unacceptable for the international community as co-chairs at the level of the presidents. They said that status quo is unacceptable. It means that if you accept the status quo, it means that we are legalizing illegal use of force. No country can accept legal the situation resulted from the illegal use of force. It's written in the Charter of the United Nations. That's it. Maybe, maybe we can all agree just to blame it on the Soviets and go from there. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, a, is there a non-NK question? We can come back to NK, but a non-NK <clears throat> question. Yes, right there. Um, Kamran Mamedov, I'm a Fulbright scholar from Georgia, ethnic Azerbaijanian. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the thought-provoking and brilliant discussion. Um, I, I want to take advantage of this situation and want to say that, um, unfortunately, today, Azerbaijan treats ethnic Azerbaijanians in Georgia as um, means to reach its ends in, in Georgia. Uh, they treat us as diaspora, which we don't accept. And we say that we are inherent part of Georgia, and we are proud of it. And also, we are brothers uh, of ethnic Azerbaijani, uh, Azerbaijanian people in Azerbaijan. And let's be brothers, not, not stepbrothers. Don't treat us as stepbrother. Um, so one example of that, SOCAR is financing our education. Students, ethnic Azerbaijanians get um, uh, financial uh, support from SOCAR. But what happens after that, SOCAR tries to micromanage those young people in Georgia for their interests. I, I mean, myself, I'm a Fulbright Scholar, State Department pays my education, but United States never tries to micromanage me. And in this case, when I, I am uh, very, um, big proponent of United States interest in Georgia. Let's, let's let it be natural so that that would be the best political approach. And when it comes to my uh, question, uh, how Georgia and Azerbaijan ended up in the situation for very tiny piece of land where today with the radicals and extremists in Orthodox Church and the Russian soft powers in Georgia try to radicalize uh, the opinion in Georgia and try to um, create a bad narrative about Azerbaijan, the country, and ethnic Azerbaijanians in Georgia. Thank you. Can I, Ambassador? 
thank you, Cameron, uh, for your question. First part of your question about the uh, Azerbaijanians in Georgia. First of all, Georgia and Azerbaijan, we are strategic partners. We are good neighbors. There is a thousand, his, thousands of years of history behind two countries where Georgia and Azerbaijan are people were you know, eternal friends. Uh, as regards you know, Azerbaijan's living of Georgia, you know, we simply consider them as a citizens of Georgia. We always, in our communication with our Georgian friends and counterparts, we say that Azerbaijan is in Georgia, they should learn Georgian language, and they should be integral part of the Georgian society. Some of them even we are not satisfied with not knowing Georgian language very well. Therefore, Azerbaijan contributes in coordination with the Georgian government, in closer coordination, and their understanding and their blessing, and even their support for education or contributing to the schools or building the schools and so on, infrastructure development in the communities uh, where Azerbaijanis live. For example, you mentioned Sokar. Sokar provides the free gas to all churches in Georgia, including the Armenian church, Georgian church, and some other uh, religious communities. I believe it's a Sokar's uh, you know, uh, positive contribution should also be appreciated. For example, Sokar provides 95% gasification in Georgia. Before, it was not the case, not only in Georgia, in some other post-Soviet countries, 94 even mountainous villages have a gasification, and biggest taxpayer in Georgia is in a Sokar. Therefore, uh, we believe that, you know, it's also, I'm more than sure that it's also a view of our Georgian friends and partners, but uh, we have in a closer cooperation and coordination. When it comes to uh, the uh, recent uh, border uh, discussion between Georgia and Azerbaijan, Really, uh, you know, beyond some uh, uh, expressions or views, uh, you know, highlighted by uh, some uh, individuals in the social media, I believe that Georgia and Azerbaijan, we have a strategic dialogue, an open dialogue, and we are ready to discuss on every issue. Because with a border demarcation issue, you know, it can happen between, two, uh, two, between many countries. Uh, if you have a land, land border, there could be certain issues. But most importantly, as a civil people, we are sitting around the table, and there is a legal commission from Georgian side, from Azerbaijan side. They had their meeting in Baku, and they will have their meeting in Georgia. And as the normal people sit together, check the legal documents, and I'm sure that uh, they will have a uh, you know, right conclusion sorting out this issue as well. What happened to all the hands that I'd seen? Okay, right there. <coughs> Thank you. Hamza Sharzuda, graduate student at Georgetown. So Azerbaijan was negotiating with the European Union for a few years of the new agreement, right? And nothing so far has been concluded. Um, Azerbaijan has been saying that it's 95, the agreement has been already, you know, negotiated, but the 5% remains. And the whole negotiations are very not very transparent. So I'll be very curious to know what's the main obstacle for reaching any agreement with the European Union. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm also somehow involved in the discussion with the European Union on the partnership agreement that Azerbaijan is discussing uh, with the European Union. European Union is the biggest partner of Azerbaijan. 50% of Azerbaijan trade goes to the share of the European Union. And the biggest investor in Azerbaijan are the uh, EU uh, companies and EU countries. Even within the breakfast, uh, Brexit concept, uh, AU can, countries continue to be the biggest investors in Azerbaijan. So that to bring our level, uh, our relations to quality of a new level, uh, there was a discussion between AU and Azerbaijan to have a strategic partnership agreement. And this agreement consists of three parts, political part, sectoral part, and trade part. Uh, political and sectoral parts are almost finalized, and we have a trade chapter. Trade chapter, because you have, you know what, European Union have a very strict and very powerful trade policy and trade commission. And of course, in EU-Azerbaijan relations, we are talking about the equal partnership. And we're also saying it to our EU friends. Within the Eastern Partnership concept, there are some, you know, six countries are participating. We always say to our EU partners as well, we are not at a country but asking for the donor assistance from EU. And uh, we are also the country, if you look at the wider geography of the European Union, as a troublemaker. Uh, for the European Union. What we want is an equal partnership. Within the equal partnership process, of course, on some trade issues, you can have a different views. Just one example, trade discussions or the discussion on, those, uh, on such an agreement between uh, Japan and the European Union lasted more than six years because the two sides had a different views. Uh, as regards with Azerbaijan and European Union, we are still discussing some issues related with the trade because EU companies, of course, Azerbaijan market is quite attractive market, mid-income country, and there is a big potential. 
And EU countries would like to reach out to Azerbaijani market, yes. And Azerbaijani companies also would like to reach out to the European market. And two sides on some trade issues can have a different views. In normal negotiation, it's something normal. But most importantly, we have a constructive dialogue and engagement. And matter of days, Johannes Hahn, EU's commissioner for enlargement, will be in Baku. And we are also expecting Donald Tusk's visit to Azerbaijan. General EU Azerbaijan's important partner, and we have a good understanding and dialogue on many issues, including on connectivity, energy, trade, investment, and humanitarian dimensions as well. Yes. Need a microphone over here. Uh, Kathy Kosman. Um, in light of your discussion of the <coughs> multivectoral, multilateral yes. uh, policies of your government, um, why did you expel the OSCE mission from Azerbaijan four years ago? Yeah. <coughs> Azerbaijan is a, a member country of the OSCE, and uh, Azerbaijan is also a contributor to the budget of the OSCE. And at one point, because Azerbaijan, it was an initial period of Azerbaijan's independence where we needed capacity building projects, and we also needed an assistance and OSC, some other international institutions, and contributed to building of the capacity uh, in Azerbaijan. But at some point, uh, we, in our discussions with our partners from the OSC, and considered that there is no current need for the OSC's physical presence in Azerbaijan for conducting certain projects. And uh, therefore, uh, there was a discussion that, you know, simply there is no need for that. But also, uh, you know, within the OSC, sometimes there is a discussion that sometimes OSC always looks to the east of the Vienna. Sometimes we should also look to the west of the Vienna. I can also say that there are some many countries within the OSC, they also have some questions and issues. For example, anti-Semitism is raising up in some Western European countries. Do we need an OSC mission in all of these countries to check all of these issues? Yeah. Uh, it can also be there are issues that we can widely discuss. Therefore, Azerbaijan, we don't think currently the physical presence of OSC office in Baku, but we are a member of the OSC. We are cooperating with the institutions of the OSC, and we will contribute to the budget of the OSC. But of course, we also have an expectation with the OSC that OSC's standards and rules should be applied on an equal basis to all member states, and one member nation cannot be can, uh, cornered or in a sense that OSC can also be misused for certain uh, political issues. Yes. I don't know if you can see me from here, but the I was I was one of your favorite, you were one of my favorite constituents when I served in, <laughs> in Congress. Bill Dahl. <laughs> All right. I couldn't see because of the fact I, I, I understand. I didn't have a chance to uh, <laughs> speak to you earlier. You know, I'm aware that there's multiple discussions going on <clears throat> about the future of the region and the potential for economic collaboration. Is it the position of your government that Armenia would be welcomed into that effort, into that initiative in terms of Central Asian countries? Yes, we openly said in our discussions to Armenian side as well that we are ready to sit together as part of the substantive talks, as part of the discussion on the resolution of the conflict, and to discuss the economic benefits of the conflict resolution as well. Just one example, a couple of years ago, it's now open secret, even Azerbaijan suggested that one of the pipelines can run through territory of Armenia. And the issue that divides us can unite us as a result of which Armenia can also get benefit. For example, the pipeline, Baku Tbilisi the Jayvan pipeline runs through the territory of Georgia and it brings two billion US dollars of something to the annual budget of the Georgian government. Can it be the same for Armenia? Yes, but that time they refused because Sarkisian and Kucharian were a completely you know, different people. So, and even Kucharian said that we are ethnically incompatible, Azerbaijanis and Armenians, I completely against that. But of course, in the resolution of the conflict, Azerbaijan is ready to look at the economic issues and economic cooperation with Armenia. But of course, we need withdrawal of Armenian troops, seize the fact of occupation, seize the fact of the military issues, and then afterwards, but then create environment 
for the wider regional cooperation, including the cooperation between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And most importantly, Armenia can effectively get benefited from the transportation and connectivity projects that Azerbaijan is providing. Just one example, recently Armenian Prime Minister, uh, Armenian Prime Minister or Armenian government presented the uh, project of economic development of Armenia. First thing, it's up to the Armenian government to decide. But first thing they start and saying that we start with the defense industry. But I'm sorry, with the starting with the defense industry, building successful economy is not going to work. Successful economic model, first of all, runs through the cooperation with the neighboring countries. And opening the border with Turkey and opening border with Azerbaijan can really bring a lot of benefit. And first of all, Armenian people are going to get benefited. Questions? Yes. Thank you. Uh, uh, my name is Aram Margaryan. I'm the DCM of Armenia. Yeah. Um, I mean, returning back to Nagorno-Karabakh conflict and, and uh, the re resolution, you, uh, I appreciate your statements and commitment that Azerbaijan is uh, underlining the importance of the peaceful settlement of the conflict. And uh, as uh, George Kent stated in his, well, in his introduction remarks, he brought the three main principles of the resolution of the conf conflict which are namely the territorial integrity, non-use of force or threat of use of force, and, of, and, and the self-determination. But then when you elaborated, uh, the, uh, elaborated about the resol uh, resolution of the conflict, you are mainly focusing on the, on the territorial integrity issue and basically neglecting the other two parts. And uh, also like Ambassador Morningstar said that uh, the need for uh, without kind of preconditions starting the talks. I think that in this case, the without preconditions starting the talk would be just to sit, accept, accepting those three principles as the main basis for the negotiations and without trying to create precedences among the principles. I think that would be the, uh, that would be the, uh, the only way. Otherwise, as my, uh, as, as our uh, Prime Minister Pashinyan also stated, that uh, we need the parties need to sit and to come to uh, one general understanding and interpretation of those three core principles of the conflict resolution. Otherwise, any misinterpretation can can just simply take us away from the resolution. So, my question now is that. When do you think the parties, and in this case, uh, uh, my question is to you as, as, as the representative of Azerbaijani government, when you can openly and sincerely talk about this and, and say that you accept those three principles and the conflict is going to be resolved on the basis of those three, uh, and, uh, those three, uh, th those three uh, issues. And uh, just one PS, uh, when you were talking about the need of the reconciliation, uh, and, and uh, you said that you envisage that after the peace, Azerbaijani and Armenian people are going to live next to each other in harmony and peace. But you kept on, uh, I mean, underlining the intolerant nature of Azerbaijani people, you uh, kept on calling uh, Stepanakert Khankendi. And I do think that by underlining that you also neglect the, uh, the right of uh, Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh. Thank you. Comments? Yeah. <coughs> First of all, <coughs> uh, thank you uh, for your comments and question. Uh, from the, these principles that have been elaborated by the OSC Minsk Group co-chairs, First of all, we should look at it. From where they are coming? They are coming from the Helsinki Final Act. Helsinki Final Act in 1975, that has been adopted. And along with principles, what is the philosophy of the Helsinki Final Act? Helsinki Final Act put an effective end to the issue of the borders in the European continent. Along with the norms and principles of international law, Helsinki Final Act come up with yet another principle that's the inviability of the internationally recognized borders, but yet another fundamental principle. If we are speaking in the context of the Helsinki Final Act, from where OEC Minsk Group co-chairs are getting their mandate as well, in the ACE para ACE, Helsinki Final Act says that self-determination should be exercised in conformity with the territorial 
integrity. We are not denying the right of the self-determination of Armenian and Azerbaijani communities of Nagorno-Karabakh, but of course, it shouldn't come at the expense of the violation of Azerbaijan's territorial integrity. As regards the threat of force and use of force, it's also one of the principles in the Helsinki Final Act. But Helsinki Final Act also says that one member country cannot and shouldn't use a force against the territorial integrity of another country. Physical presence of Armenian armed forces, you know, it's yet another issue really, uh, because Armenian youngsters are spending most formative part of their time in the trenches as part of the mission for the occupation. What are they doing in the sovereign lands of Azerbaijan? The Armenian coming from the Gumru, from Yerevan and some other cities, they are in a sense fulfilling the mission of the occupation. That's a fundamental issue here. Uh, and uh, second part of the question uh, was uh, about yeah, uh, Azerbaijan. Because Azerbaijan, really, we are proud of our tolerance. I also grown up in Ganja. In Ganja is the next biggest city of Azerbaijan, next to the Armenians, Jews, Russians, and they were living uh, as one community, and they continue to live. In Azerbaijan, sometimes it's a missing element. 30,000 Armenians are continuing to live in central Baku. In the central downtown Baku, that's called Targovo, Armenian church is standing over there. Once you have a visit, chance to visit Baku, and you can see also the books, Armenian books are also well preserved over there. And uh, uh, within uh, the process that you said that I referred uh, to that area with a different name, but I referred to that area with its original name. In my constitution, in the, uh, uh, according to the laws and norms of Azerbaijan, that's called the city called on Khan Kandi. But of course, we are not denying the rights of Armenian community who are citizens of Azerbaijan as well, who have a right to live in peace and dignity over the region. But again, returning to the concept of self-determination, really, we should also you know, highlight it. And let's be frank. Self-determination's philosophy doesn't mean that you can use a force against someone else. Self-determination doesn't also mean that you can violate the rights of other group. Self-determination is one of the core fundamental principles of international law, as a result of which Armenia and Azerbaijan also become independent states after the Soviet Union. And also self-determination, again, doesn't call for using a force. Unfortunately, late 80s, and there was a use of force against the Azerbaijanians from Nagorno-Karabakh, and they were expelled. And based on the current realities, and there were different uh, deliberations. And uh, that's in a real situation over here. Current state quo, as I already said, is unacceptable. And rules-based approach should also be applied. And we should also miss the element of UN Security Council resolutions. In 1994, these resolutions have been adopted. And the three co-chair countries have also contributed to the adoption of this resolution. What does this resolution say? It says that by use of force, acquiring territory is unacceptable says that Azerbaijan is facing humanitarian catastrophe. It also says that immediate, unconditional, and full withdrawal of occupying forces. That's everything is written over there. And based on that, let's you know, move forward. That's it. Yes. We have five minutes left, so. Thank you. Robert Davidisian, Anchor Office in the United States. I'm very glad that you are so uh, strong supporter of peace. I really hope that when you mention the refugees from the Karabakh zone, you also mention the 400,000 Armenians who left Baku, and your society should be ready to accept them, which is uh, situation is as clear there. So, sir, I think that there is a general in the air the notion of your administration to present this conflict, to continue presenting this conflict as an issue of territory, and you condition the uh, signing of a final peace with restoration of control that uh, over the territory that your country lost during the aggression against my country. Let me ask you this. In 1991, Azerbaijan was in control of those territories, but still you chose to initiate a large-scale aggression against then enclave Nagorno-Karabakh, which already presumes no any Armenian, large Armenian uh, involvement. In 1992, when half of the territory of Nagorno-Karabakh was occupied by Azerbaijan, you still chose to continue pressing us in violation of the re UN resolutions you just mentioned. And when Mario Raffaelli said that until we speak here, the subject of the negotiations is going to disappear, where do you see the logic of uh, suggesting us, and I'm also one of those who uh, failed the entire 
uh, strategy of dealing with the Karabakh issue. I was, I was born and raised in Stepanakert, and I, of course, I remember everything. Where is the logic? Where do you see that? Also, considering that uh, recently we also marked the 25th anniversary of the signing a ceasefire, I know Azerbaijan has different interpretation of the how many countries are there, uh, participants to the um, ceasefire. Our signature is there, the commander-in-chief of the Army of Nagorno-Karabakh, and there are also video materials saying that there are three countries. Don't you see, as an advisor, that it would be much more wise to suggest to administration to restore the initial format which was in force up until 1998 and which proved to be the most effective period of negotiations. It's not for the sake, our state doesn't depend on that, and believe, you, uh, believe me. But it will be the most constructive way uh, to uh, move forward because since 1998, everyone agrees that the only major uh, achievement was non-resumption of hostilities up until 2016 when Azerbaijan attacked us again. Thank you very much. If you can uh, comment on those two. Can I? Uh, Mr. Abetisian, thank you for your question. I am approaching you as a my co-citizen, and we are sharing citizenship of one country, and hopefully uh, we will be uh, in Karabakh again, uh, living in, uh, side by side in peace and dignity within the territorial integrity of Azerbaijan. But you have uh, you know, interpreted some things, uh, of course, that doesn't reflect the reality on the ground. Who started the war? And the, who started the war? Like, Late 80s, there was a separatist movement in Nagorno-Karabakh region or autonomic oblast of Azerbaijan. And there was an element of the use of force, even the terror. Azerbaijanis have been expelled from Khan Kandy and some other cities as well. And with the independence of two countries, Armenia started full-fledged war against Azerbaijan. We didn't lose the territories. They have been physically occupied. And occupation is illegal under the international law. And we should respect the international law. And what we are asking, and we are not asking with the international community, withdrawal of Armenian troops from the occupied territories of Azerbaijan. And you also say that Armenians in Azerbaijan, my own ancestors are from Armenia. So there was an indigenous people living in Armenia. And uh, 250,000 Azerbaijanis, they expelled, my ancestors are from the Goethe, where they call seven. And they have also then right to return back. Therefore, uh, yes, Armenians lived in Azerbaijan, and Azerbaijans lived in the current geography of Armenia. By the way, Armenia is the only country in the world that's in a mono-ethnic. There is no other ethnicities living in that country, but it's up to Armenians how to decide it. But Azerbaijanis have been expelled fully from Armenia as well. But we are talking about the Nagorno-Karabakh issue and seven adjacent regions, and we are simply justifying ethnic cleansing of people, 700,000 people. Have you ever, Abitizian, thought about the life of these people? They lost everything. 25 years with people. Where is the morality? What's the moral aspect of this issue? Look, I would encourage you to read the Kucharian's book. It's a recent book that's been published in Russia. That was a president who was a warlord of Karabakh conflict. By the way, Armenian people punished him as well. What Kucharian says? Kucharian says that Yes, we occupied Kalbajar on a deliberate basis. And when international community and UN Security Council, the UN Security Council adopted a resolution condemning occupation of Kalbajar, we said that what we can do, let's occupy Agdara region of Azerbaijan. International community will forget, and they will switch to Agdara. And he did, occupied Agdara. And then he says that international community started discussing about the Agdara, we occupied Agdam. And everyone forgot about it, and so on and so forth. As a result of which, along with Nagorno-Karabakh, seven regions and more than 700,000 people have been expelled. And have you ever also, Armenian people, thought about that as your neighboring country, Azerbaijan, we faced one of the biggest humanitarian catastrophes of the world after the Second World War? It was a relatively small country. I was grown up in Ganja, and it was in a one major bulwark where we have received and refugees and IDPs. And there was an in, not enough food even to feed Azerbaijan refugees and IDPs, and they were living in the tents. And with other moral issues as well, along with the international legal aspects of the conflict. Let's be realistic. You know, we cannot take one. You see that I'm not denying the right of yourself, that you are coming from the Armenian community of Nagorno-Karabakh region of Azerbaijan Republic. But you, why you are also denying the same Azerbaijani, for example, your counterpart, Tural Ganjaliyev, is originally from Shusha. They had a nice house in Shusha. Their house has been destroyed. 
he was going to the Shusha Chess Club, and he was, his father was a teacher of the chess for Armenians and Azerbaijanis, and their entire life has been shattered. Have you also thought about that? Have you also thought about the cultural heritage of Azerbaijani people in Nagorno-Karabakh? Have you also thought about the Agdam? It's a completely destroyed city. It's a ghost city, right? What kind of messages you are sending to Azerbaijani people when you are talking about the peace? Yeah? Uh, let, it, well, it's also fair questions, really. Okay, yeah. it, it's, okay. two, it's 2.30. Let me, uh, let me just say this. It's an interesting conversation, and I think, and I thank everybody. I think everybody's been respectful during, during this conversation. But what it, what it points up, and I think one of the basic problems, is that each side in this conflict believes in good faith that they are right, and that justice is on their side. And at some point, if this is ever going to get resolved, we have to get beyond arguing on these kinds of issues and coming up with what's the best solution today for Armenians and for Azerbaijanis. So I would leave the comment, leave that comment at that. I really want to thank you. Ambassador, you if go you ahead. Let me just one concluding remarks. Uh, I also see some members of the uh, uh, Armenian lobby groups or diaspora communities in uh, this room. Some t time by time, let's be frank, and they are attacking personally me as well and my government. Okay, they're fine. What my message is on that, really, if you think that you are doing any constructive work for the benefit of Armenia, completely no. You are exploiting, for example, Armenian diaspora's resources and so on for the wrong purposes. What I would encourage you, contribute to the Armenia's peace, Armenia's peaceful relations, and also uh, Armenia's own development, that Armenia can also live peace and dignity. The current work you are doing is a completely unconstructive, is not any helpful. Well, let's not get into a debate on that now. But uh, you, it's gave, up to you gave the message. It's, up, but it's always <laughs> much easier to sit in California, in Paris, to have your coffee with a croissant mm -hmm. and nice life in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. But Armenian people having a difficult over there, it's a different story. Anyway, I want to thank, 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 thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, everyone. I want to thank you for a very constructive discussion. Thank you.